Hello, it's Wendy, and today I'm going to be showing you how I made a giant wall tapestry to go up in my home. This is part six of a DIY series that I have here on CBC Life that is all home decor, so make sure you check that link in the playlist if you want to see the rest of them. I teach how to sew on my YouTube channel with Wendy. If you want to check that out, you can go do that too, but let's get started with this tapestry. Tapestry weaving typically requires a loom, but since we are going for size and I'm trying to keep this easy for you to get it done, we're going to use a table. Flipped on its side, two of the legs can be used to form the top and the bottom braces for a loom. Next, I picked up a collection of the thickest yarn that I could find, as well as roving, which is a long bundle of fiber that makes beautiful plush sections. I'm going to show you what to do with each of them as we go. But keep in mind that the thicker the yarn you can get, the faster you'll make progress and the easier this is going to be. Taking some butcher's twine or any other strong string that doesn't stretch, I tied a knot at the top left corner and looped my way back and forth between the upper and lower table legs. At the end, I tied another knot and did my best to even out the strings so that they are an equal distance apart. Since we are working with thicker yarns, you can easily make these loops two to three centimeters apart to fit them comfortably. It is important that these strings are even and tight, so take some time to increase their tension from the beginning to the end. If you want to be in with the tapestry terminology, this string is our warp, and the horizontal yarns that we're going to weave will be our weft. Starting at the bottom, I wove in a stiff material that I had, but poster paper would also do fine. And this helps to make sure that we have enough string at the bottom when we're done to finish off the ends. Above that, I wove in a yardstick which has no risk of bending, so it helps to lock this whole area in place. All of this was about 15 centimeters tall from the bottom. Our tapestry begins with a footer. So I took some strong nylon rope and I wove this through for 12 rows. Any non-stretch rope would do and there's no need to ever tie a knot to the tapestry at the beginning or the end of this footer. This is the most basic type of weave where each row just goes over and under the opposite of the previous row. At the end, cut off a tail that's about 15 centimeters long, and I did tie a knot at the end of the rope to prevent it from fraying. Then I tucked it behind the tapestry, and that completed the footer. So an easy way to make a big tapestry is to have some long fringe. With this cream colored spiral yarn, I'm cutting some one meter long pieces to get that started. Using a technique called Orion Knot, I folded the yarn in half and brought the two ends around the outside of neighboring strings and back out from the middle. Then I pulled it tight and brought it down to the bottom. So as you can see, the left yarn goes around the left string and the right yarn goes around the right string, so they're both coming out in between the strings and we pull down. I repeated this to the left until I was happy, and then I added an extra layer above that, making sure that I used the opposite pairs of strings from the first row. Beside that, I wanted to use my dark green chunky yarn, so I cut fringe but a little bit shorter than the first cream yarn. I hope you're getting a sense of how free this is. Honestly, you just pick any color and any length you want. This is your tapestry. With the green chunky yarn, I added a thinner section than the cream, and I still stuck to having two rows. For the next fringe over, I decided to add some black shoelace-like yarn. To bulk up its thickness, I did three strands per knot instead of just one, like we'd been doing with the green and the cream. 
Here I figured some fabric strips could also look good. Don't be afraid to look through any other crafting supplies you might have lying around the house. You never know if something is going to add some nice texture and depth to your tapestry. Once you're happy with the fringe layer, we can start building upwards from there. So I started in the lower right area with a simple weave. I just went over and under each string and made sure that it was the opposite of the previous row. So if the previous was over, the next row up should be under. It's important to let the yarn be relaxed, so never tug tightly because that will force your tapestry to get narrower and narrower as you work up. Always just let it breathe and push it down every so often with your fingers. When you want to change colors, it's best to make sure there's some overlap between the neighbors, otherwise you will form holes in your tapestry which will weaken it. Here you can see with my black yarn that I overlapped it with the cream on that same string as I worked my way up. One of the more annoying things about weaving is passing a large ball of yarn through the strings, but if you wrap a figure eight between your thumb and your pinky with a bunch of yarn, you can build up a smaller ball that is easier to weave and won't knot. I did this with two strands of green yarn so that it could build up twice as fast when I was weaving. With this green yarn, I wanted to have long hanging loops, so first I did a basic weave of three rows. Now I'm going to show you another technique using any pencil, stick, or in my case a chopstick. Let the yarn loop around it once before going back up to pass behind the next string. For even loops, wrap them all around the stick as a guide, but for freehand loop lengths, no stick is needed. As you can see, I got rid of the stick and just dragged on the loops to adjust them to the height that I wanted. Above that row of loops, add three more rows of basic weave and that will help secure them in place so they don't come undone. You can keep stacking loops as much as you like, just have three rows of basic weave between each of them and leave a tail as you cut off the excess yarn. I continued building up from there to make some hills and valleys from the flat starting position. My goal with this piece was to have variety in texture and color, so I tried to separate similar yarns. As you can see, I continued to make sure yarns overlapped on the same strings to avoid creating holes. When starting a new yarn, what I do is I find the lowest point where I want it to begin. I leave that 15 centimeter tail behind the tapestry and then I begin weaving back and forth. As I push down with each row, I let it grow to the neighboring strings that are horizontally available. So you build up and reach for more strings as they become within reach. Depending on where each row starts and ends, that determines the shape of this patch of yarn. Now every weave technique looks totally different depending on the type of yarn that is used. So this beige loopy section is the exact same technique as the long freehand green loops that I did near the beginning. So let me show you how I did that. First, there were three rows of basic weave and then I looped the yarn around a chopstick before passing it behind the next string over. Once a whole row of loop was done, then I added three more rows of basic weave above that before removing the chopstick and voila, now you have all these cute little loops that are the same size. Over here on the left, I'll show you how to make that thick braid like weave. I doubled up one of my thicker yarns to be even thicker and then I started at the far left. The braid is actually two rows on top of each other. So for the bottom row, I looped the yarn around each next string and pulled it out from above. Then for the top row, I loop the yarn around each next string, but instead I pull it out from below. So I go around and when coming out, come out below instead of above. This forces the two rows to make an opposite pattern which looks like a braid. This technique is called sumac and here I'm doing it with this thick yarn, but if you do this with the thick roving that I mentioned in the beginning, it will also look really plush. 
As I neared the top, I slowly leveled out the weave so that it was nice and horizontal again. Just like the footer, the top needs a header from the same non-stretch rope, and then I rotated the table to look at the back. What awaits us here is a mess of yarn tails that need to be tucked into the weave. I created a makeshift needle using a pipe cleaner and zigzagged each end through a few neighboring yarns. Just make sure you don't pierce through the entire tapestry and accidentally show up on the front. Once the back is cleaned up, it's time to cut this tapestry off the top beam. Cutting one string at a time, I started at the left and I wrapped the left string over, under, and down on the string that is to its right. Over, under, down. This continues all the way across and it does get harder as you go due to the weight of the tapestry. So if you can flip your table to lay the tapestry down on its face, that would be really helpful. Unfortunately, I was way too stubborn for that kind of wise behavior and was very determined to continue this way even though it really took some arm muscle. This is the tapestry after it was cut loose from the top beam. Now it is lying on its face and it is still attached to the bottom beam. Before getting to the bottom, I will show you how to completely finish off the top. Using a large needle, I threaded each string down its nearest weave up the neighboring weave and then back down its original weave. Make sure this only passes through the back side of the weave so it doesn't show up on the front and after its loop around, it can be cut short. Now onto the bottom. The first thing I did was remove those fillers that I had originally inserted. Then each string could be cut free and I tied each one into a double knot with its neighboring string. You may be wondering, why didn't we do this much easier technique across the top? Well, it's because it's a little bit ugly due to the way it leaves the strings unfinished, but in the case of the bottom, the long fringe is going to hide it. Our tapestry is now free! To hang it up, you can use any rod. I used a one inch copper rod and I hand sewed it to the top of the header with that same non-stretch rope. It's just looping through the entire top edge of the header and around the rod over and over. I did want a slightly relaxed fit, so as you can see, there is a small gap along the top. This one right here used to be this little rope with a four strand braid, but then after I tied it up, I undid the braids and you get this beautiful curly crimped look. So I love how that turned out. This one right beside it is actually a trim from a fabric store. It's a strip with all these tassels hanging off of it. So I just wove the strip into the backing and let the tassels hang down. That same thing was done for this. This used to be pom-pom trim, but once it's stacked, it kind of looks like little white berries. This one I don't know if I'm going to trim. Kind of reminds me of a dog. <laughs> this is the rope that it used to be, and then I kind of just like unravel some of them wherever I feel like it. So this is with all of it completely unraveled. So you just get all this furriness. I originally intended to trim this one to a shorter length, but after seeing the two of these together, I'm gonna keep the way it is. It's very free form. Now I have shown you four basic weaving techniques that are almost all you need to do any of these large natural style tapestries. They're the only four that I used and they are one, this basic over and under weave or tabby weave, which I used here to create those flatter areas. Number two is the raya knot, which I used in these places to make the fringe. The third one is a pile weave, which I used in these spots to create loops. And the fourth one was sumac, which I used here to make the thick braids or some flat areas that have a little bit more texture. And with that, I'm ready to show you my finished large tapestry.
tapestry looks hung up on the wall. I super, super love it. And my only wish is that it won't get dirty so that it can stay nice and clean and beautiful. Being totally transparent, this is the second tapestry I've ever made in my whole life. And that's how it turned out. So I really think you can do it. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more of these DIYs on CBC Life. You can also check out my YouTube channel with Wendy if you want to see all the DIYs and sewing ideas that I do there. Thank you all so much for watching. And if you're subscribed, then we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.